New videos every day. Hi, welcome to Psychology by Sandy. Today we are going to be discussing sexual fetishes. And this is a bit of a complex subject, so we are only going to be able to cover the basics. However, we are going to cover the fundamentals, and there may be a couple more videos to cover the rest. Now before we get started, I would like you to pause the video and leave a comment listing what your fetish is. And this is only if you're brave enough, if people know your username, then maybe you don't want to and you don't have to, it's okay. However, if you can just pause the video, leave your comment, and we will continue. First, we are going to go over the meaning of the word fetish because people commonly actually use that word incorrectly. Now, in psychology terms, fetish actually means a sexual association with a non-living object. And here is what the American Psychiatric Association has to say in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. Fetishism involves the use of non-living objects, the fetish. Among the more common fetish objects are women's underpants, bras, stockings, shoes, boots, or other wearing apparel. The person with fetishism frequently masturbates while holding, rubbing, or smelling the fetish object or may ask the sexual partner to wear the object during their sexual encounters. So yeah, you can have a sexual fetish for stockings or boots because they're non-living objects, but you wouldn't necessarily say that you have a foot fetish. Now what people commonly refer to as a foot fetish, there's actually another word for that, and we are gonna go over that in just a minute. However, let's first go over the origin of the word fetish. The word fetish comes from Latin factitious, which means artificial or man-made. Now, it also means an object that has supernatural powers, or more specifically, a man-made object that has powers over others. The word was first coined by Charles Brosis in 1757 while studying religions, more specifically African and Egyptian religions. And in these religions, they had these figurines which represented gods or persons and these figurines would represent some sort of power over the group or the tribe. Now, I'm sure you've heard of a voodoo doll. Well, a voodoo doll in this sense would be considered a fetish. Over the years, the word fetish has been bastardized to mean an object that one has some sort of sexual association with. So what would you call a foot fetish, which is not technically a fetish? In psychology terms, this is called paraphilia. Paraphilia, philia coming from the Greek word friendship or love, paraphilia meaning above or beyond friendship or love. Now in psychology terms, paraphilia means a sexual association with a non-sexual object, action, or thing. So a foot fetish would be a type of paraphilia. However, there's many different types. And here are some pretty crazy examples of some paraphilia. Aquaphilia. Arousal from water and or in watery environments, including bathtubs and swimming pools. Incestophilia, sexual attraction to a member of one's own family. Macrophilia, sexual attraction to giants, giantesses, or giant body parts, such as breasts and genitalia. Microphilia, sexual attraction to miniature people or miniature body parts the opposite of macrophilia. Narratophilia, sexual arousal and the use of dirty or obscene words to a partner. Necrophilia, sexual attraction to corpses. Pedophilia, sexual attraction to prepubescent children. Plushophilia, sexual attraction to stuffed animals and or people dressed in animal costumes. Skediophilia, Sexual attraction to cartoon characters. Zoophilia, sexual attraction to animals. So the thing about all these different types of paraphilia is they are psychologically the same thing. 
It's a sexual association with something not considered sexual. So you take water, children, panties, or plush teddy bears. They are essentially the same psychological phenomena. Sexual associations are very much like mental or emotional associations. Let's say you think of things that make you happy, like a great moment in your life or your car, and there's some things that make you sad or upset. Well, the human mind is capable of producing the emotional associations with things as well as producing sexual associations with things. Now, of course, if you have a sexual association for something which people don't really consider socially acceptable, then you have a paraphilia. The thing you have to understand about psychiatry is they have this box. And whatever's inside the box is considered normal. Now, if you go outside of the box, at the top or the below, you have a mental disorder. Let me give you some examples. It's okay to be happy, but if you're too happy, you're considered manic. And it's okay to be sad, but if you're too sad, you're considered depressed. And of course, it's okay to concentrate on things, but if you don't concentrate enough, then you have ADHD. Or if you concentrate too much, you have obsessive compulsive disorder or autism. And of course, it's okay to love yourself, but if you love yourself too much, you have narcissistic personality disorder. And if you don't love yourself enough, you have inferiority complex. And of course, during the day, your emotions can vary. But if it varies too much, then you have bipolar. And if it doesn't vary enough, you have the flat effect or flat emotion. The thing about this box, whatever is inside the box is considered normal. But how does a psychiatrist tell you what is in or outside of the box? What is too little or too much or something? Now, the American Psychiatric Association in the new DSM is planning on creating what's called diagnostic thresholds. So they are going to figure out a system to tell you where the lines are. Now, personally, to be blunt, it's kind of a matter of opinion, arbitrary opinion and social judgment. Now, let's go back to paraphilia for a second. So you have a sexual association with a non-sexual object. Well, is that inside the box or is it outside of the box? Now, let's say you have a panty fetish, right? You like panties. Well, that's probably socially acceptable, so you're in the normal box. Now, let's say you like dating 15-year-olds. Well, that is definitely socially unacceptable, so you're going to be labeled with a mental disorder and go to jail. Now, the way that psychiatrists figure out the lines of that box is they look at three things. One, does it cause you distress? Two, is there an impairment of life functioning? And three, is it legal? Now, for a couple of examples, let's say you sleep with an underage girl. Well, you're automatically going to be labeled as a pedophile, a mental disorder. Or let's say they catch you with exhibitionism. Well, not only are you going to be criminally prosecuted, but they are going to automatically label you with a mental disorder, exhibitionism. So those three things that psychiatrists base it upon, right, distress, impairment of social function, or is it legal, don't have to be a disease. It can just be a, a moral problem. You know, it's a judgment. Is it right or is it wrong? Let me give you an example. Let's say you are turned on by teddy bears. Now, do you feel that it's right or wrong that you're turned on by teddy bears? Now, that can cause them distress, can it? Or let's take the case of you doing something illegal. Well, of course, it's going to cause a little bit of impairment of social function if you're thrown in jail for a couple of years. Or let's say you really get off on spaking your wife, and she's not having any of it at all. Well, that's going to cause a little bit of social function impairment as well. So you can have those three things, and it's not a disease. It's either a social judgment or it's a moral decision on whether it's right or it's wrong.
the next video, we are going to talk about how people develop fetishes or how paraphilia can be developed. We're also going to be talking about panty fetishes in Japan and also what psychiatrists do to treat paraphilia. Now, please, please subscribe to the videos, leave a comment, and I'll see you next time.